You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Do you come from a land down under? Women glow and men thunder. Can't you hear? Can't you hear the thunder? Oh yeah! You better run. You better take cover. We got there at the end. We did. Unfortunately, you remember how we sometimes in the old days we'd be like, "Oh, let's do it again." No, and now it's like, "Whatever, just keep going." Yeah, halfway through, I was like, "Are we going to?" Nope, we're going to plow right through. <laughs> Today, we're talking about our favorite cards from Unfinity. We just are we just jumping from set to set here. There's been a lot of sets, so little time, and typically unsets are the fun jokes. But today, there are real some real cards we can talk about. So, welcome everyone to the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. Oof. Yeah, they released uh, four sets, really, if you count Brothers War, which is on the yeah. horizon, um, in rapid succession. Unsets usually don't matter to Commander players. This one does, so we're going to be going through our favorite cards from Unfinity this episode. If, if you, if you want to pick up any of these Unfinity cards, well, the best place to go to do that is Card Kingdom dot com slash command that's our affiliate link it takes you to the card kingdom website card kingdom is the premier service to buy your cards online they really do have the fastest shipping in the business that's the number one reason that i use card kingdom is when there's like a, a commander night coming up or we're yep. drafting soon and we know the day and it's a few days away and i know i got to get the cards in <laughs> time card kingdom is the only place i trust to get me this stuff in a timely manner like fast enough that i can use it right away and you know when you build a deck on online, Jimmy. You're excited to play it. You want to get your hands on the cards right now. Yeah. You don't want to wait. Cardkingdom.com slash command. Fastest shipping. Great service, too. They really are the premier, like, high-end e-commerce website, I suppose, for yeah. magic and gaming products in that if there's ever a mistake, first of all, they make fewer mistakes than everybody, but when there's a mistake, they go above and beyond to fix it as well. So again, cardkingdom.com slash command. Can't recommend them highly enough. And they support the show when you use that affiliate link. That's true. And you also support the show when you use this affiliate link for ultrapro.com slash command, because once you get those card kingdom co- uh, cards at, you know, at such a high rate of velocity, hurtling through the mail towards your doorstep, you got to make sure they don't land and get dinged up. So put them into a sleeve, an ultra pro sleeve. <laughs> They like come in hot, like you, you need to catch them. <laughs> yeah, you gotta catch them. <laughs> yeah. That'd be cool. Competitive sleeving. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Uh, uh, have you ever seen Melissa DeTora's sleeve cards? I've seen her unsleeve cards, and it's frightening. I how guess they fast used to race that. in the Pro Tour, and she's like, she'll sleeve a deck like so fast that you're like, what the heck? Yeah, and she is sleeving it because it makes that shuffle feel better and it protects the cards that you love the most. Uh, and that's what Ultra Pro provides. We've been loving their sponsorship because they give away free stuff at the end of every game night. And we personally use the products. That's the biggest endorsement we could give. And you can pick up this stuff too at ultrapro.com slash command they have tons of stuff usually on sale as well as things from the past older sets things that you might not even realize were still out there and they're the only place you can go to get stuff like exclusive secret layer art promo play mats oh, yeah. sleeves and more as well as your local game store you support ultra pro you support us and now you have a fun affiliate link to use should you like to do it online yeah also tons of good deals on their site you can always find lots of discounts so many yep and of course the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone there's all kinds of cool perks for patrons you get to see game nights extra turns earlier than the general public also we've been playing spell table games uh every single month jimmy and i devote at least a half a day to playing spell table games with the patrons a bunch of members of our team do that also we have a schedule that's posted and then of course another cool perk is we shout out one lucky patron every single episode Woo-hoo. and this episode is dedicated to, to robbie sarson robbie you rock you rock. Okay, Unfinity is the latest unset, and unsets have been around for quite a while in Magic, so today on the show, we're going to talk about both the unset as a whole, some of the crazy special nuances of it, and then we're going to break down some of our favorite cards from the set. Now, typically, these cards in the past, it's a joke set. It's like a play on Magic. They have a big silver border, and that means illegal in all formats. However, yeah. that's changing. <laughs> yeah, the, the unsets are a tradition in magic at this point, right? They've uh, come out like every, I don't know, five or six years or so. And they're silver bordered. They're kind of like Mark Rosewater's like the main uh, person behind them at Wizards of the Coast, kind of a love letter. A lot of inside jokes about magic, but always in the past, they've been silver bordered. And there's kind of a hard rule in Commander that silver bordered cards are not legal. 
So for this set, Infinity, they made a big change, and that changes that. It's basically a black-bordered set. All the cards are black-bordered, or they're borderless cards. And you can get silver-bordered cards in the packs, but those are from the list uh, in that sort of reprint slot they've been using uh, right. in, in all sets. And just in Infinity, they made it, you know, some of the cards on the list are the silver-bordered stuff. So it kind of... I don't know. It obscures the line between what's legal and what's not legal. So I think the first thing we should talk about is how to tell which cards from this set are allowed to be played in Commander. Yep. And it's pretty simple, but it's also a little complicated <laughs> as it goes. So <laughs> typically, you could always just look at the color of the border of the card. Uh, now that they are black bordered, the way to understand whether or not it is going to be legal in Commander and other legacy formats is the bottom of the card, but not always. So the bottom middle where that sort of hollow holo stamp foil. go, th there's like a hollow stamp that goes on like rare and mythic cards. Yeah. So if you've noticed, uh, they added this onto rares and mythics recently in the past, I think like five or six years, every single one of them has a hollow foil stamp on it. And they all now, they're now using this to designate certain things. So, uh, just to take a small aside, the universes beyond have an upside down triangle mm. in that spot. You'll remember if you look at any of the Warhammer cards, uh, just to indicate that they're from a non magic universe. And for unset cards, if they are legal in Commander and Legacy formats, it will have the same oval hollow foil stamp. And if it's not legal and it's only legal in the unset, then it's going to have an acorn, a cute little acorn hollow foil at the bottom. However, <laughs> <laughs> That's not, yeah, it's not always true because only rares and mythics have the hollow foil stamp in the yes. middle of the card there. Commons and uncommons typically don't get that because it was originally, I think, conceived as a way to fight counterfeiting. Yeah. Uh, harder and to, harder to similar do. to how like on a hundred dollar bill, they'll have that one band there that's yep. just, you're supposed to make it harder for it to copy it. Well, <laughs> commons and uncommons don't have the hollow foil stamp in the middle because you would generally not want to counterfeit those cards. However, they might be able to be legal in the format so basically, if there's just a solid black line down there and no hollow foil, uh, it's legal. But if there's an acorn down there in the middle, then it's not legal. Yeah, and typically the acorn cards are the ones that are like draft, you know, like take a chair and put it on the table type of cards. Things that are like get a signature from everyone around the room, very much in the unset uh, theme. But there are tons of cards that are legal in Commander as a result. So if it's black bordered and you don't see an acorn, that means you can go for it. But still... Double check, because there may be a corner case. There may be some misprints. There's lots of things that overcomplicate this. But, it, you know, that's a good question, though, which is why is this so darn complicated? Yeah, I think it's a nice to have a brief discussion point here, because it seems to me that the by far the way easier solution would have simply been to silver, border. silver borders, <laughs> silver border the cards that are not going to be legal and black border the cards that are having some black bordered cards that are not legal because they have an acorn is confusing as all heck. It, yeah. It's easy to miss just going through previous season. I kept sort of forgetting and be like, well, that's crazy. Oh no, never mind. It's not yeah. legal. And well, I saw same, the same card with an acorn and a hollow foil stamp and the previews. And I was like, I, now I don't even know which is which. So yeah, it makes it a lot harder. If you just do the border thing that was already established, everybody already knew it. And I know that their reasoning is twofold on this that I've read or heard about. One is they wanted to do borderless cards. Uh, okay. So that made it hard with the silver border, to which I say, cry me a river, too bad. You just couldn't do borderless for the for those cards. You know, just I think that's worth it overall to just make it clean for everybody to understand and mm -hmm. easy to just parse when you just glance at the card. And the second reason was a little more convoluted, and I don't remember where I heard this, but somebody said something to the effect of like, they're trying to get people used to the idea that some crazy cards might be playable in Commander, even if the Rules Committee doesn't technically say they're legal and everybody should just kind of chill out and just, <laughs> you know, then that way people might even start playing with silver border cards uh, and things like that. Nice. That sounds definitely convoluted. It, it It's, you know, it was presented sort of as a way to like blur the line on purpose so that maybe the line would kind of, people would get the, the message that blurring the line is cool. You should do that in Commander and you should right. use the uncards. And to me, that's just not understanding how players work. Like in general, players play the game and they want to know where the line is at. They don't want it to be super blurry because the blurriness is where we get into like, you know, gray areas that are hard to resolve where you think right. something's okay and I don't. Yeah. And there's no authority. We need an authority that comes in and says, you know. X is X and Y is Y. Yeah, as much as possible. Just because, yeah, that, that, that dynamic game is, socially is just hard to work out otherwise. Yeah, the game is way too complicated as it already is. There actually was a small period of time, I think two years, three years ago maybe, where the rules committee was like, hey, just for a few months, silver board cards, let's just call them legal. Unstable, yeah. And just see how it works out. 
And that was still a rule zero discussion around the table, which is like, hey, I'm going to do this thing. By the way, no one I knew did it. Um, so now we're in a different spot where, you know, instead of even having that conversation, we just have to have a lot more confusion. So, I mean, I think that was, and I don't know this for a fact, um, but I think that, you know, it was like over Christmas or whatever. And they yeah. said, hey, silver border cars are going to be le- legal for six or seven weeks or something weird. I think that was at the behest of Wizards, who was like, we released this product. We want people to buy it. And try it out. Why are they going to buy it? if they can't use any of the cards anywhere. Uh, so, hey, commander people, will you just please like say something so that they can use them for at least a little while so maybe they'll buy the... Pro- That's what it felt like to me. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind the spirit, by the way, of, hey... I want to try building around the silver border commander. I think that's totally fine. And as long as it's not something that like actually disrupts the gameplay, like, Hey, everyone, you need to go do ring around the rosy, the table five times every right. time play or whatever, then yeah, let's go for it. But I think it definitely feels like that with what you've said. Now that they're printed in black border, people will just know that, Hey, you know what? I can get this product and it feels like I can play with more of the cards because you can, but not all of them. And that little acorn symbol is what's going to help you know whether or not it is legal in commander or not. I mean, ultimately, unsets are meant to be draftable, and I think that's where they're the most fun. Totally. And I have to admit to being slightly annoyed the fact that they're starting to encroach officially upon Commander, uh, just because we're going to see, and the next thing we're going to talk about is part of that annoyance, I, I, and I guess I'll just not bury the lead here, it's the stickers. Yep. So if you look at certain cards in Unfinity, you'll see a new symbol that looks like a little sticker or a raffle ticket. Yeah, it's a ticket. Um, They're ticket counters. And there are certain cards in Unfinity that are going to create stickers, basically. And you get tickets to put stickers, and the word sticker is on the card as well. There's a lot of new things that are being added, and these are all legal in Commander. I'm not sure if all of them are. Not all of them, but this idea of, right, the stickers are not exclusive to the unset. Right, so in packs you open, there'll be a sticker card, and that sticker card is not, you don't put it in your deck. It's a game piece that you're going to be referred to by other cards, and then we'll use it. So I guess... And we're talking about literal stickers, by the way, for those that are not in the know. You peel something off, and you put it on something else. Right. And, and you put it onto a card, and it changes the properties of the card. Uh, so you might give a card an ability, you might change its power and toughness. It, it's It's pretty complicated, but this stuff is... Uh, legal and commander, so I guess we should talk about it. In fact, Jimmy, you and I are not... It's complicated enough that Jimmy and I are not experts. I spent 30 straight minutes reading Reddit threads and official articles, and I still do not fully understand how this works. So uh, we're going to bring in uh, somebody on the team here who does understand it and can help us explain it. All right, so I'm here with Jamie... Hello. Block, who you've met, I'm sure, on other episodes of the podcast. He's one of our writers here. Jimmy, you're also kind of our rules expert. Sits behind the scenes at Game Nights and Extra Turns. Make sure that we don't mess anything up. That is when you're not playing on Extra Turns. Um, We want to talk about stickers, and you are the person that seems like they know the most about them. Uh, If you're watching YouTube, we're going to put some up on screen. There are cards like Tusk and Whiskers and Carnival Carnivore, which I want to talk about because... They reference stickers, but they also reference ticket counters. Yes. So they say things like, you know, add, and then they have a little ticket symbol or two or three. Some have three. Um, And then you may put a sticker on something. Um, I didn't understand at first exactly how that works, but you can't just put a sticker on something unless a card tells you you can. Is that correct? Yeah. A sticker exists on the sticker card and cards will say you may put a sticker on a permanent you own even if a card says that it would let you put a sticker on a card you don't own you can't just the rules about stickers are you can only put them on cards you own when a card you play tells you to right and you still have to pay the you have to have the amount of ticket counters to pay the cost of the sticker in addition to that right it's not like it says you may put a sticker on and you can just pick a sticker you have to pay the cost right so every sticker sheet has three name stickers three art stickers two ability stickers and two power and toughness stickers okay the we'll we'll put some on screen here it's slimy burrito illusion and night bushwag ringmaster so if you're looking at them on screen uh they have three names at the top then what is this middle part Uh, These are the art stickers. There are cards, including some that are commander legal, that care specifically about putting art stickers on things. And they care about, like, how many hats are on the characters you wear, and this allows you to add a hat or something like that? Yeah. Now, I don't think that any of the commander legal cards care specifically about what's depicted in the art, Mm. but there are cards that literally say, whenever you put an art sticker on a card you own, you get an effect. I think there's one that gives you treasure. So gotcha. it's the act of putting the stickers on that matters in Commander more than the stickers you actually chose to put on. 
Unless we're talking about the ability stickers and the power and toughness stickers, which are sort of near the bottom half of the card. Yes, and these are where the ticket costs come in. You'll see that next to each of those stickers, there is a ticket with a little number in it that represents how many tickets you have to pay to be able to put that sticker on something. So let's say you have no tickets and a card says you may put a sticker on a permanent you own. You can't put an ability or a power and toughness sticker on it. You can put you one of the names or the uh, art stickers, but not one of the other ones. Exactly. Gotcha. So a lot of cards will say you get, let's say, two tickets. Then you may put a sticker on a permanent you own. Uh, you could do anything that has two tickets or less. You could also choose to decline, save up your tickets, so the next time you play a card like that, now you can afford one that costs four tickets or less. And tickets are counters you get. They're like energy. They're right. a lot like energy. They're a counter you have. You can proliferate them. Oh. So they are a separate resource that's sort of, you know, a similar to mana and that is a cost and you need to have that available resource to pay the cost. If you look at, let's say, Knight, Brushwag, Ringmaster, you can see that if you want to put a Menace sticker on something, it'll cost two tickets. If you want to put a Persist uh, sticker on something, it will cost three tickets. If I put a Persist sticker on a creature, when it goes to the graveyard, it still has Persist? Yes. Like when it, when it dies the second time? Yeah, so stickers stay on cards as they go between public zones. So in Commander, that is the battlefield, the graveyard, and the command zone. And then I would assume after the game is over, that sticker is removed and it doesn't get yes. in between games. Because exactly. otherwise I could be like, well, last game I put a Menace, a Persist, and also a Double Strike sticker on this, and it just has that forever now when I play that. That wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you, how do the stickers work as far as what stickers I have access to? Let's say I have, you know, Tusk and Whiskers uh, and Carnival Carnivore in my deck, so I know I'm going to have some access, access to stickers or an attraction or something like that. Um, do I just get to pick whatever sticker card I want to have available there, or how does that work? So the way stickers work in Constructed, and in Draft you just keep the sticker sheets you open, uh, but in Constructed you choose at least 10 different sticker sheets to show up with. Ten? And then 10. How many are there? There are, I think, 48. Oh, wow. Okay. And then before the game starts, you choose three of them at random that are the ones you actually have access to, and that's it for that game. You can run out. You can get to the point that a card could stay could say you may put a sticker on a permanent you own, but you're legitimately out of stickers You've because they're all thought. already okay. in play. So each sticker card has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten stickers. It would be pretty impressive if you ran out. If you did you 30, could, but it's possible. Yeah, and you could run out of the type you want. You could run out of power and toughness stickers, and that is the kind that your deck perhaps cares about, but you would have six of them. So you start with random t with 10 that you've chosen, and then you get three of those at random. Oh, so this is a high variance thing because I'm guessing with, you know, only 48 sticker cards only, that's a lot. But it would be hard to guarantee that, like, let's say you really wanted to build around giving something the persist trigger, or sorry, persist sticker. It's probably difficult to even guarantee you would have a persist sticker on any of the cards that you have access to for any given game. Is that true? Yeah, it's very hard to build around a specific sticker. You can do your best to up the odds of, let's say there are four or five sticker sheets that have a sticker that gives you some sort of graveyard recursion. You could put all of those in your deck and just plan around the fact that you're going to get at least one of them. And maybe your plan involves putting that on your commander and putting right. some sort of loop together. But you cannot count on it. There is a chance for any one ability you're looking for that it just doesn't exist on enough sticker sheets for you to guarantee it. So there's a lot of variance there. Okay. That is good to know. Is there anything else about stickers that we didn't cover here or is that kind of the, the bare bones of understanding? I think that's most of it. Just to clarify uh, in talking about running out of stickers, when a card that had a sticker on it goes to a hidden zone, you remove the sticker and put it back on the sheet. So you have access to that sticker again. They're, they, you can get multiple uses of them per game. Oh, interesting. I did not know that. Okay, cool. Thank you, Jamie, for clearing that up. Yeah, of course. All right. I had to do so. All right. Thank you, Jamie. Hopefully that made it clearer. Did it? I don't know. You let us know. Um, if, if that... If the sticker situation is complicated, let's complicate it a little bit more here because there is another type of card, a new card type yeah. that exists in Infinity. And again, they've done this before. Contraptions 
is something that existed, but those were not legal in Commander, and attractions are so less... Attractions, by the way. Yeah. By the way, the theme park set, the, the set is themed around the theme park, so tickets and attractions. Attractions yes. are like rides or, yeah. you know, uh, you know, like little games Balloon that you play stand, at the carnival. Balloon cards. Or, yeah. yeah. So we'll bring some attractions and put them on stage here. There are cards that refer to attractions... <laughs> on stage? Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on screen. Uh, there are cards that refer to attractions, and it usually says open an attraction. Yep. And so let's talk about how the rules of these cards work first okay. um attractions start in your attraction deck so you have a totally different deck full of attractions that are outside of your main library and it's basically another sideboard that's outside the game sideboards typically are not legal in commander but attractions create a sideboard type of area that yeah. is legal it's not a sideboard but it's similar um in commander you must have at least 10 attractions in your attraction deck. You can't have less, and none of them can be duplicates. Yep. Uh, so you still have to fo follow the singleton rules. This is made a little bit messy because there are multiple versions of attractions with the same name. <laughs> we'll get into why that is, yeah. but you can only have one of any attraction that has the same name. So you, e even though there are different properties, it's kind of like... Um, there was like a Crypto Command variant from the yeah. Unstable, and it, it had like totally different modes from card Four to card. Four different versions. Yeah, yeah with it's kind of like that yeah. in some ways. Um, so at the beginning of the game, you shuffle your attraction deck at the start of the game, and then you put the top card onto the battlefield. Now, attractions will never go into your hand or your regular deck, your library, and they don't go to the graveyard either. either. They go to the junkyard, which yep. is separate from your normal graveyard. It's basically the attraction deck graveyard. Yep. There's a side graveyard just for that deck. And normal graveyard interaction will not interact or affect the junkyard. Yep. So e attractions are all artifacts, I believe. And if you have something that says, you know, take an artifact from your graveyard and put it on the battlefield, it can't take something from the junkyard. It can only take something from the graveyard. Yep. So if you look at the card of an attraction, uh, we'll show one on screen now here. Uh, there is a one to six number at the bottom right of each of these cards. And you'll notice that the number one is never highlighted and the six is always highlighted. Now you may have figured out, oh, one through six, this corresponds to a dice. Right. And you're correct. So this is how you visit an attraction is by rolling D6. And again, to visit attractions, you need cards to do so or it happens, I believe, at your pre-combat main phase. So, yeah, I, I want to clarify something you said there because numbers in between one and six can also be highlighted. Right, it could be two, three, four, and five can also be highlighted. Yeah, so there'll be multiple car or numbers highlighted on each attraction. It'll never be one. Yep. It'll always be six, and then sometimes there's one or two others. And then, yeah, you roll... At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, you roll a D6. If you roll a number highlighted on any attraction the effect of that attraction activates. So let's look at like uh, bumper cars, which is an attraction. The numbers highlighted in the bottom right corner are two, three, and six. So at the beginning of my pre-combat main phase, I roll a D6, and if I roll a two, three, or, three, or six, so I have a 50-50 chance here, then I visit the attraction, ding, and what ding, that ding. means is target creature must be blocked this turn if evil. So that goes off. Now, I, you can have multiple attractions. Let's say I also have Balloon Stand out, mm -hmm. and that creates a 1-1 one, one flyer, or I can... Or, well, I guess that's all it does, because the other is an activated ability where I sacrifice the flyer to do something. But it also has a 2 and a 6. So let's say I roll a 2... I'll get to make something must be blocked this turn and create the 1-1. One, one. Right. So you're visiting multiple attractions at once based on that singular dice roll. Yeah. And then, of course, there are other cards that also allow you to visit an attraction or roll the dice to try and visit an attraction. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the, the, even the term visit an attraction yeah. is, we have to be very specific because these cards say visit, dash, and then the effect. So visiting them is rolling the dice. and then, Visiting is well, sort sorry, of is, when they trigger. Is when you yeah, get the dice roll that matches a highlighted number on the right bottom right side. Yeah, so some effects will Ooh. give you benefit outright. Some will require like a little mini game to be played. Last thing I suppose to note about the attractions, there are 22 of them that are legal in Commander. But again, remember, there are some that are the same name but have different... Usually they have different numbers highlighted mm -hmm. in the lower right corners. It's just so you can choose which highlighted numbers are in your attraction deck, you know, which numbers you want to go for. And in general, we're going to talk about this later, you're going to want to go for the ones that have higher number totals because... That's how a lot of other dice rolling cards work. They want you to roll high numbers, so you're going to already sort of have payoffs tied to that. So in general, you're going to want to roll high numbers, and you're going to want your attractions to trigger off of the high number rolls. If you're even playing any attractions, and uh, I don't think they're really super worth it, and we won't go too deep into it, but a lot of these feel, again, they're balanced for limited, more so than commander. But again, you can play them should you want to. So just letting you all know that. All right. 
That's all the new sort of mechanics and Holy crazy moly. things. So now we can actually talk about the cards. Uh, we've picked out sort of our favorites and the ones we think might see actually see some play in the format. Yep. And uh, so yeah, so in no particular order, let's just kind of start to go through them, Jimmy. Yeah, this but, first one's pretty fun. Yeah. Okay, this is Magar or Magar of the Magic Strings. A one black and a red for a 3-3 three, three legendary creature, Minotaur Performer, and it has a very long activated ability. So you pay one black and a red, and then you will note the name of a target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard and put it onto the battlefield face down. Okay, that right there, easy. Pay three mana, find the name of an instant or sorcery in your graveyard, write it down somewhere, and then you take that card and you flip it face down. It becomes a creature. In fact, it's a 3-3 three, three creature with the text... Whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you may create a copy of the card with the noted name. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. And it also has the text, if this creature would leave the battlefield, exile it instead of putting it anywhere else. So it's a lot of text, but it's really quite simple. Um, you pay three mana to find a target or instant or sorcery in your graveyard. You write down the name, and then you flip that card over so you know what that thing is. It's Why do you a, have to write down the name? It's so weird. I don't know. Note the name. I guess you could mentally note it as well. You could you also, just just also just look, look at it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when that creature deals combat damage to a player, you create a copy of the card, of the noted card, not of, right? So the creature is still there, but you create a copy of that card that you right. noted, like Brainstorm, whatever. Copy of the card that it is. Yeah. And then you get to cast it. Yeah. So uh, if it's a rampant growth, let's say, then every time it deals combat damage to somebody, you cast rampant growth. Yep. It's a uh, pretty sweet thing because it doesn't get rid of the creature. You would think, oh, the creature itself becomes cast. No. If the creature leaves the battlefield, then it would be like if you flickered or you do something to it. Yeah, then it's going to be exiled because a sorcery and instant cannot enter the battlefield. Yeah, but if you can somehow get something really sweet there, you can cast it if, as long as you can do combat damage, you know, every turn or every combat, actually. Yeah, and so... As a result, there are a lot of very impactful spells that you cast it once, it kind of sucks, but you get it on the creature and it keeps dealing combat damage, you cast it multiple times, you're in for a lot of fun. Um, Temporal Extortion is a fun one. It's just a black, 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 black sorcery, and when you play it, any player may pay half their life rounded up, and if they do, they counter the spell, and because the spell says take an extra turn after this one. So every single time if you hit with a 3-3 three, three and someone has to pay half their life to stop you from taking an extra turn, that's going to add up really quickly. And that kind of spell, typically not very good unless you have a way to re-trigger it over and over again, right. which is kind of fun. Um, and then a lot of the Minotaur fans out there are screaming about Death Bellow War Cry. This is an 8-mana sorcery where you search your library for up to four Minotaurs with different names, and then you put them on the battlefield and then shuffle your library. Nice. So if you can cast this twice in a Minotaur deck or a Changeling deck, that's, that's pretty much game over. Sure. Uh, Brass's Bounty. There's a lot of really impactful spells. Yeah, uh, Brass's Bounty every turn seems broken. Worst Fears every turn. You control target player during that player's next turn, and then you exile the spell. But here's the thing. It's a copy, so you just get to cast it over and over again. Right. Uh, pretty crazy. Yeah, and the thing about some of the high CNC spells is if you can just mill them into your graveyard, you don't ever have to have cast them in the first place. Oh, totally. Yeah, and that's the way to go, right? So this is a way to sort of cheat the mana cost. Yeah. Um, and of course, you're sneaking the damage in, so you're probably using unblockable type stuff, Whisper Silk Cloaks and things like that to get them through. Yeah, cards like Bedlam, which is creatures can't block, seems pretty good. And then Invasion or Axis Tunnel, where you pay three mana to, to tap it and target a creature with power of three or less, can't be blocked this turn. You got lots of those types of things. Invasion plans, you can choose how creatures block thieves tools i think really what you want are cards that can help discard into the graveyard and then from there you're going to be casting them so one card which is like an all-star in this deck is Razaketh's right it's a three black black sorcery and it is demonic tutor you would never pay that for demonic tutor it's way too much mana but you can cycle this for one black mana so very early on you can pay a black discard this draw a card and then copy it later with uh, magar's ability mm-hmm also, all the creatures you make are colorless, so all is dust will be a one-sided board wipe for the most part. Magar will die. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, that's cool is a word for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, key to the city is, a lot of people point out, is one of the best cards in the deck. You can tap it to discard a card, and then up to one target creature can't be blocked this turn. So, seems very good. You discard a card, target a creature that you want to attack, and then blammo. You get a card in the graveyard, and you get a copy of whatever that flipped over card mm-hmm, is. Mm-hmm. Dragon's Rage Chandler seems very good. Every time you cast an instant or non-creature spell, you surveil one. Uh, this this deck is filled with instants and sorceries. So you just go nuts there. Uh, unmarked Grave, one in the black. Search your library for a non-legendary card. Put that into your graveyard, then shuffle. Brand new card, very powerful. Doesn't this instantly go infinite with any extra combat? 
spell? Yeah, it should for the... I think so, because you just attack... As long as you can get the combat damage into one player, then you will be able to cast the... Whatever that uh, attack again spell is. Yeah, or if you have something that made it unblockable, it usually makes it unblockable till end of turn, or if you have Whisper so Cloak on something. Yeah. Then if you've got... If it's a Fury of the Horde, then you're just gonna... Attack. Keep going, attack, cast Fury of the Horde, untap. Untap everything, attack. attack. Yeah. yeah, you kind of stop once you can no longer get that 3-3 in. So just giving it uh, unblockable, yeah, seems like a way to just win on that spot. Yeah, those seem like among the most... I guess extra turn spells too, but that's not in black-red. No, nope. so, yeah. Nope. Um, yeah, and then if you're casting or copying stuff, you have your typical Storm Kiln Artist, Gutter Snipe. Um, these are all cards that obviously want to cast a lot of spells. So I think this card, Magar, is also just very playable in any Rakdos or Grixis decks that's got instant or Sorceries. Like, Kest Distant Mage and Hello the Painter are perfect, because you're going to already have a ton of instant or Sorceries in the graveyard, and if you want to rebuy them in interesting ways, Magar lets you do that. You can pretty much do it at instant speed, because you can wait till your turn is up, pay that three mana, put a creature out, and then swing with it instantly. Yeah, it doesn't even require a tap of on it so it's just you can do it the turn you play it yeah you might consider playing a card like hearthstone in this deck which ca- makes activation cost cost one less so then it's just black red to do so but this seems like a spell slinger deck or some weird janky minotaur deck <laughs> the minotaur seems yeah that seems weird you need enough instants and sorceries that this is going to be good yeah but yeah and you're in the haste colors too so it's possible to sort of do some wacky st- i mean do stuff out of nowhere especially it's in the 99 nobody expects it yeah so play it activate it angers in the graveyard it's a fury of the horde swing could be game yeah and if someone doesn't have removal or a way to get rid of it and stop it from attacking again it could be game yeah that's uh that's a little scary pretty, pretty cool scary pretty you can scary. do cool stuff with it all right the next card is a card we talked about when it was revealed which was like a year ago or something 11 months but we're gonna talk about it again because i think it's probably the single most likely card that you're gonna see in on the battlefield in real commander games yeah uh it's saw in half it's two and a black for an instant. It says, destroy target creature. If that creature dies this way, its controller creates two tokens that are copies of that creature, except their base power is half that creature's power and their base toughness is half that creature's toughness. Round up each time. So if you target a 4-4 with this, let's say, or let's say it's Moldrifter, right? Yeah. Uh, if you target two, Moldrifter two. with this, which is a 2-2 flyer that enters the battlefield and you draw two cards, well, it would... Kill the Moldrifter and then make two token copies, except they'd be 1-1 one, one flyers yep. that both say draw you two cards. So you would draw four cards and have two 1-1 one, one flyers at the end of that. Yeah, so it's fun. This is kind of like uh, goo enemies, like uh, Ochre Jelly and Mitotic Slammer ones that sort of split in half. You never, ever, I think, want to cast this on an opponent's creature. Yeah, I, I can't think of... Because even if it's a 1-1, one, one, doesn't it just stay as a 1-1? One, one yeah, you round up? up each time. So yeah. there's no way it dies. Um Legend matters. I mean, legendary rule doesn't really apply. They'd sack one of them. So yeah, you, you can like half their uh, yeah. Their, their How often toughness. is their power and toughness what you're going after when you're killing something? It's almost always yeah. because you know the ability on it is what's scary. Yeah, and so many cards have great enter the battlefield abilities. So this doesn't seem like a very good removal spell. It seems much more like a combo maker, and that it is. Yeah, that it is. So obviously, if you like saw in half a dockside extortionist you get two dockside. oh my god yep uh that's very obvious but the original combo that people were talking about so twin flame and dual caster mage very classic twin flame basically gets you copy a creature that you control and then for each of the copies you create a token that's a copy if you want to strive it and do mm-hmm. more but dual caster mage when there is the battlefield it copies a target instant or sorcery spell and you can choose new targets for the copy so twin flame dual caster mage is infinite two twos you just make a bunch of them twin flame sees dual caster and says cool let's do it again um it's even better. Uh, Sondheim is even better than Twin Flame because it makes two copies. So you create two dual caster tokens. So you can do some really messed up stuff. So the other thing is that Twin Flame is a sorcery and Sondheim is an instant. So mm. Josh, let's say it's your turn and you go to cast Demonic Tutor. Okay. How are you feeling? Pretty good. I'm going to go get my best card in my deck. Yeah. You know what I want to do? I want to draw every single card in my deck and win on the spot mm. because I have a dual caster mage and a, tw- and a um, saw in half. So I can respond to your demonic tutor with a saw in half targeting anything. And then while I hold priority, I then cast dual caster mage. Dual caster mage comes in, sees saw in half and goes, hey, let's copy that spell and let's target me, dual caster mage, so that it saws dual caster mage in half. You get one dual caster mage, two dual caster mages. One can, again, look at the original saw in half and do it again. And the other one's going to look at demonic tutor. So then you just repeat. Every single time you get two of them, one of them repeats the saw in half and gets another two copies. And then one of them grabs demonic tutor. So you end up with 
every single card in your <laughs> deck, demonic tutor to your hand. Thing, yeah. And then, you know, if any of them are instants or sorceries too, you could interject them in there. Let's yep. say you have one of them was a lightning bolt. You put lightning bolt on the stack. Correct. And then start copying that instead of demonic tutor and yeah. win that way. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You don't even need to, you could just demonic tutor one time for a lightning bolt, cast lightning bolt and just do the same thing. So because saw and half creates two copies, it allows this thing to like allow dual caster mage to fork out because it makes two of them. They both see something. It's fury the, storm kind of. Yeah. Yeah. In a way. So, it's it's crazy because it's just instant speed. You can do it right then there. You can even do it after two opponents have just countered each other five times and you go, cool, y'all done? I'm going to do this thing and just win on the spot. <laughs> it does take a little bit of mana, but it is pretty powerful. Um, and then you have other just targets in general. In you have your deck. fair things you can do. Yeah, you can like target your Grey Merchant of Asphodel, which is pretty powerful. So Kukusho. Kukusho. Oh, man. You get a lot of Kukushos. Yep. So there's lots of different ways for Sawn have to be very good. I think any deck like Yarok or you play Panharmonicon, you're going to play, you're going to want to play this card because it's just out of nowhere, three mana, getting two more of a powerful ability, maybe even doubling it again. Whew. Yeah, this card is nuts. Um, I think we're going to see it a lot and it's going to be doing powerful things every time you see it. Yep. And we've been talking about it and people have been doing broken CDH combos with it since it got premiered 11 months ago. <laughs> they're so. using it already, but the set hasn't been out. It's uh -huh. still not out. Well, now but they're... I think it's out. The set's out for people watching right now. Yeah, they're but... priming to get it. Um, all right, let's go to the next card here, which is a legendary creature. It's Mira the Magnificent. Two, a blue and a red. So four mana for a two, four. Legendary creature, human performer. It says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell from your hand, open an attraction, uh, which we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. And then you can pay X and tap Mira and exile target instant or sorcery card with mana value X from your graveyard and choose an attraction you control that doesn't have a midway counter on it. Put a midway counter on it. Whenever you visit that attraction, copy the exiled card, you may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. Oh, that makes sense. I have no idea what you just said. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so attractions are these things. You have your separate attraction deck. We talked about this earlier. Up to 10 cards, or it has to be 10 cards, has to all be different. Yep. Uh, you exile a instant or sorcery card from your graveyard with mana value X. You pay X and tap Mira. And then you basically, whenever you visit the attraction so that you've chosen. So you're rolling that dice pre-combat main phase. Yeah, you're casting a copy of the card. So you basically gotcha. tie your one of your cards to one of your attractions and say, when I activate that attraction, which means visit it, mm -hmm. when I trigger that, uh, you know, the numbers in the lower right corner on that attraction, I'm going to be casting this card that I put there, basically. Right. And, and you can only tie one card per attraction. That's why I say put a gotcha. midway counter on something that doesn't have a midway. So you, they didn't want you to be able to take one attraction and say, oh, Loading when I hit up. that, I cast these four spells. Right. Right. Uh, notably, yep. attractions are artifacts, so they can get removed from the battlefield. They yep. go to the junkyard, again, the attraction uh, deck. So it's interesting because this triggers anytime you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you get open attraction. So I feel like you could open three or four attractions in a single turn if you wanted to. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, listen, I don't want to go super deep on this card as far as like what the instants and sorceries are that you're going to do. And there's combo type stuff. And I'm sure mm -hmm. to me, the attractions are the new part here. And so talking about them a little bit is interesting. Um, there are good attractions that do all kinds of things. There are token creators uh, like balloon stand and clown extruder. There's removal on attractions. Bounce chamber bounces things as you would think. Ferris wheel is a phases stuff out, which is a mm. fairly permanent way to get rid of some stuff. It says choose target creature that hasn't been phased out with Ferris wheel. That creature phases out until you roll a three or less while rolling to visit your attractions. Ah, okay. So that's a thing where you can uh, choose one of their commanders maybe and you know, depending on how the deck's built, maybe you just don't try and visit attractions anymore. You're just like, your deck's off. Sorry. Yeah, or you control the dice rolls, which there are lots of ways to do that, too. Uh, and then there's card draw stuff in attractions. There's information booth, storybook ride. Or storybook ride. This deck's going to probably put a lot of attractions into play, so I think you're playing you know, a high number of the 22 that are legal in the format. And, you know, you're going to use the new cards from the set to open more attractions. There's mm -hmm. something called Quick Fixer. Command Performance is really good because it is an, a, a sorcery that opens an attraction. So oh, you can so put, then that you can put that onto an attraction. On. Yeah, oh, okay. exactly. So the big things here are you're going to be rolling dice to try and visit your attractions, right? Mm -hmm. And Clark's Other Thumb is an old silver bordered card that is not legal, so you can't oh, yeah. play it in this. But over the last couple of years, we've had a bunch of, because of the D&D &D sets, yep. dice rolling 
cards, cards that help your dice rolling out. So there's stuff like Barbarian Class. If you would roll one or more dice, instead roll that many dice plus one and ignore the lowest roll. So that helps you, again, hi- roll higher dice. There's stuff like Will, Blade of Frontiers. Pretty much the same text. Yep, and then there's like Pixie Guide. Yeah, pretty much the same text. <laughs> right. All of them basically say roll more dice than you were going to and just pick the good one. Yeah, and red and blue are the dice rolling as they are the coin flipping uh, colors as well. So you can still manipulate the dice to a pretty high degree with some of these cards, make sure that you are rolling high numbers. Um, and then the attractions are also artifacts, like Jimmy said. So I think you can build your deck to just take advantage of the fact that they are artifacts. Because just an artifact on the battlefield, even if it did nothing, is right. worth it has value because it triggers things. It mm-hmm. can be it can be used for things. So there's like the improvised mechanic. Yeah, inspiring statuary allows all your non artifact spells to have improvise. So you play this, and this also counts as a mana towards, you know, an instant or sorcery that you'd be casting in this deck. So now you're basically tapping your attractions for mana. There's War of Invention, Sahili's Directive, there's cards that Literally have improvise on them. Uh, so Sahili's directive. Yep. Sad day. <laughs> Galazeth Prismari uh, just makes all your out of artifacts tap for mana. So all right, that's it really good. Turn, it's cryptolith right, but for artifacts. Yep. Um, then there's stuff like gear per ether grid, which allows you to tap two untapped artifacts you control to deal one damage to uh, any target. There's Reckless Fireweaver that just deals one damage to each of your opponents every time an artifact enters the battlefield under your control. There's Kark Clan Ironworks, things like that. KCA seems really good here because you're just getting a free artifact every turn. You can sack that attraction, right? Oh, not every turn, but every time you visit an attraction, you get another artifact, and that becomes two mana if it's, for instance, one that you don't want. Right, so... With Kark Clan Ironworks. Yeah, so I think that this could be a deck and it could be kind of cool. Um, it's going to be a lot because you're going to have a full second deck that you're kind of dealing with. Yeah, yeah. People aren't going to know what those cards are, so, you know, be prepared to deal with that thing. And I will say, a lot of the attractions reference stickers and ticket counters. We didn't go into ticket counters too much. <laughs> Maybe we did with Jamie, um, but they're kind of like energy. Um, so there might be a version of this deck that plays some stickers and stuff too, and that's a whole other group of cards you got to bring with you, and I don't even know how that, that works out. But anyway... Yeah. Of all the cards that deal with tri- stickers and attractions, I think that Mira is the one that's the most likely that you might see. Yeah, the Magnificent. Mira, the management, seems more like it. The manage- It's going to be a lot of accounting. Yeah, I mean, literally, you're you're opening attractions every time you roll a dice, and you go, okay, this one, this one, this one, this one trigger, this How one doesn't. How many ticket counters do I have? Do I want to make a sticker a on one, something? A 1-1, one, and then I'm going to choose to, and everyone's going to go, cool, 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 what cool, cool, They're going to cool, be like, cool, cool, cool. They're going to be like, okay, what happens? Just tell me. I'll believe you. Yeah, because <laughs> in the meantime, they're going to be jumping into their clown car. <laughs> That's the next card we're going to yeah, talk about. So this is X for an artifact vehicle 1-1. One, one. When clown car enters the battlefield, roll X six-sided dice. For each odd result, create a 1-1 one, one white clown robot artifact creature token. For each even result, put a plus one, plus one counter on clown car. And clown car is crew of two. It runs on laughing gas. I love that flavor text. <laughs> so this is a way to roll a ton of dice. So if you pay five for X, you're going to roll five dice. And you can estimate about 50-50, you're going to get Half of them are going to be one one white clown robot artifact creature tokens, and the other one's going to be plus one plus one counters on the clown car. Yeah, and you maybe care a little bit which one you want more, but in general, like Jimmy said, I think you just want to roll dice. So this goes in dice rolling decks like Vrondis. It's really good. Yeah. Because you're just going to get the payoff from Vrondis uh, as far as he just cares, did you roll dice? Yeah, one or more stuff. dice. Yeah. But you can just, again, pay this for one and get a Vrondis trigger as well. Yeah, because uh, it, it's like one or more, right? Yep, yep. Feywild Trickster seems like the best. Whenever you roll one or more dice, create a one, one blue fairy dragon creature token with flying. There's a whole dice rolling deck. Brazen and, Dwarf. Yeah. It's the Reckless Fire Weaver, but for rolling dice. Yeah, and we'll mention these cards over and over again. So get used to hearing Barbarian Class, Will, Blade of Frontiers, Pixie Guide, Feywild Trickster. They're going to come up every single time dice come up. And if D&D continues to make more sets, you can almost guarantee that there are going to be more cards that roll dice in the future. That's a really good point. I think the dice rolling deck has a pretty good outlook as far as improving over the years because we've already seen yeah. two D&D sets and it feels like the wheels are greased to yeah. you know, do that. So we're likely to see more. feels like those sets are probably done pretty well if they're you know, doing sequels this quickly. So more dice rolling. You know, If you build a dice rolling deck, I would... I would take the bet that it's going to, you know, see more pieces added to it in the next few years. It's not great right now, but it will only presumably get better. Right. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of dice rolling. Paradise Lost. This is the next card. Paradise. Oh, like I get it. Dice. Paradise. 
Like Paradise Lost. Yeah. This is three green green for an instant. Roll two six-sided dice. Return any number of cards with total mana value X or less from your graveyard to your hand, where X is the total of those results. Exile, Paradise Lost. The total of those results? Yeah. Mana Here's value X or one where you don't want to roll high. Well, it's any number of cards with total mana value X or less. You kind of do want to roll high because you add them up, right? Oh, it's total. I got yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. I thought it was just the ones that meet that converted mana cost. Yeah. So this is, again, you want to roll high if you want here because let's say oh, you'll you get roll, more. Yeah. 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 I'm if you roll, uh, no, now the most common roll, as we both know, is seven. Seven. Yeah. There are six ways to make a seven when rolling two dice. So you can roll a three and a four, a four and a three, a five and a two, a two and a five, a six and a one, or a one and a six. There you go. So one and six rolls is a seven. Yeah, so it's the most common thing uh, for all your craps players out there. And if you roll a seven, you're going to return any number of cards with total mana value X or less from your grave to your hand. It could be seven one drops or a four and a three. Actually, you can kind of do all of the combinations, too, of the right, dice roll. you can do a five and a two. <laughs> five and a two, yeah. <laughs> or a six and one. <laughs> yeah, or you can make it three cards, four cards, as long as it adds up to seven. Now, if you roll, like, two uh, snake eyes, this card is uh, so sad, so bad. Five mana to get a two mana spell. CMC spell back to your hand is or bad. Two one drops, yeah, not very good. You need to get multiple cards for this to be good because, yeah. you know, regrowth is a card that already exists. It's not an instant, but it only costs two. Yeah, so five mana, again, you have to ask yourself, if the, if you're going to expect around the seven each time, do you have good pairings of cards to bring back with it? It is instant speed, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, if you happen to play a lot of, like, Lotus Petal and uh, where are those, like, Mishra's Bobbles and stuff, then you can get all those back because they all cost zero. That's interesting. So maybe there's something there in kind of an AXZ deck. Uh, I know that Naya's got sort of a lot of that going on. But there are lots of ways to bring cards back to your hand in those colors already. So it's a little bit high variance. I think you're going to want to still have this in a dice rolling deck so you can manipulate the end result. Vrondis probably, because that's the one that has green in it. It is interesting. I didn't consider like Cheerios or eggs. If you're in green, maybe it's worth it. Like if your average CMC of your deck is yeah. pretty low and a lot of it is zero, you know, yeah, I didn't think about the zero thing. Yeah. Because even you roll a two, but you might still get five or six cards back if you, you know. Yeah, maybe one of them is Noxious Revival, and then yeah. you use that to bring another card back. So I could definitely see some kind of chain going on with this, but five mana is a lot to hold up, but instant speed does make it nicer. They were smart. They did make it so that this exiles itself, so it's yes. hard to lose. Or hard sorry, to, to loop. Hard, hard to, to loop. loop. Still easy to lose. Hard to easy loop. Easy to lose. Yeah, easy to lose. <laughs> <laughs> hard to lose. All right. Uh, we are about halfway through here. We've got half of our favorite cards from Infinity still to go. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Thank you, Marvel Snap, for sponsoring this video. Do you like deep strategic card games where you can build synergistic decks and outthink your opponents? I mean, if you are hearing our voices right now, you're commander players, so we know you do. But what that means is you need to try Marvel Snap. It's a digital card game full of awesome Marvel characters, and we've both been playing a ton of it. It was made by former Hearthstone designer Ben Brode's new company, and Ben actually plays a ton of commander, too. You put together a 12-card singleton deck to try and win two of three locations that appear on the board. Deck building is an absolute blast, and you can unlock cards just by playing. There's no pay to win. I've been using a combo of Iron Man and Onslaught. Iron Man doubles your power. I am. Iron Man. But Onslaught makes him quadruple your power instead. Ooh, that's what we call synergy. And games are super quick, so it's easy to mix up your tactics and try new things. Plus, in the middle of a game, you can snap. Which doubles the stakes. It's a unique strategic move that gives you the chance to outplan and outplay your opponents. Yeah, you can use it to get more out of a victory. Or you can bluff a strong hand when you don't have one and maybe trick your opponent into retreating. Victory. Retreating is for cowards. Yeah, but sometimes it's the right move. Where are you on the ladder? Whoa, whoa, personal question. I can't answer that. Sorry. Not that high. Marvel Snap is out now in early access on Steam and full release on mobile. Global launch was on October 18th, so you can download the game right now using our link in the description. Luck 7, autumn is finally here. So let's celebrate the season with fall's most craved flavor. Pumpkin! Ren, no! Please don't eat me! Oh, I won't, little pumpkin pal! Why, you and I could have the pumpkin feast for two from Factor, the service that delivers fresh, never-frozen meals ready to eat in just two minutes. Oh, hooray! With Factor, Seven and I can both eat our fill without having to shop, clean, or gouge out and cook your insides. Not my insides! Exactly! Factor is cheaper and faster than takeout. And and with 30 plus meal choices each week, you can spice things up while staying on top of your food goals, thanks to options like vegan, keto, calorie smart, and protein plus. In fact, now that I've fueled up with Factor, I'm energized and ready for the Harvest Tide Festival. Please don't sacrifice me. No promises. Oh no! 
Head to go.factor75.com slash command60 and use code command60 to get 60% off your first box. That's code command60 at go.factor75.com slash command60 to get 60% off your first box. Dude, I am absolutely loving the new show Rings of Power. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited for the next episode this week. Oh yeah, Josh, the show is great, but uh, the season is over. What? Yeah. No! What am I supposed to do without my precious? <laughs> okay, calm down there, Gollum. Look, if you need your fix, I've got just the thing. It is the official The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power podcast. Podcast? Oh, explain, Trixie Jimmy. Uh, sure. Well, it's pretty easy. Host Felicia Day will take you deeper into the canals of Numenor and the mines of Casa Doom. Special guests join her each episode to provide an inside look at everything it took to bring Middle Earth to life. Plus, they've got exclusive interviews with showrunners J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay, including the very first full breakdown of that incredible season finale. Finale? No! Uh, look, but it doesn't have to be over. With the Rings of Power podcast, Felicia goes behind the scenes with the cast and crew to bring you jaw-dropping stories and Easter eggs you won't want to miss. Oh yeah, that does sound cool. Maybe this podcast can be my precious. Sure, buddy. Whatever you need. Go on. Gesundheit. Watch the Rings of Power on Prime Video and listen to all eight episodes of the official The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power podcast for free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app now. Welcome back, everybody. We are talking about our favorite Unfinity cards, and there are some weird, crazy, spicy ones, including the first good boy, uh, Planeswalker. Planeswalker. Yeah, yeah, now there have been good boys in Magic before, but this one is an extra good boy. Uh, <laughs> Morrow said for this card, this is one of the, a Planeswalker that doesn't actually do what you tell it to do. <laughs> which is cute so this is comet stellar pup this is an untrained dog untrained very good two a red and a white for a five loyalty planeswalker and it has only one planeswalker ability on it it's a zero and you roll a six sided dice and die sorry and there are a uh, a lot of different things that can happen so on a one or a two it's going to plus two the loyalty and then you're going to create two one one green squirrel creature tokens and they gain haste until end of turn if you roll a three it's going to minus one and then you return the card with mana value two or less from your graveyard to your hand if it's a four or a five then comet deals damage equal to the number of loyalty counters on him to a creature or player and then you minus two and then if you roll a six, it pluses one, and you get and you may activate Comet Stellar Pup's loyalty ability two more times this turn. So we roll a dice two more times? Yeah, you roll two more dice <laughs> and you get to see what happens. So it is okay, so it's it's they're all fun abilities. So there's two This is true randomness on a card. I like that. Yeah, there's two things that are one in three chances. So either you make two tokens or you deal damage to the loyalty counters, and then you minus two. And then there are two things that are one in one in a six one in six chance. Ugh. one in six chance to either return a card to your hand or activate Comet's loyalty abilities two more times. Man, Whew. two more times because you could get another six and then all of a sudden... Yeah, you're going potentially infinite? This is... Yeah, it's hard so, to go infinite. I mean, you could get lucky and do it. Yeah, you could definitely get lucky and do it, but the way that I think this is determined in Commander games is if you can create a board state where you have a mathematical chance of getting a six and it's a higher than a 50% chance, then you can technically consider yourself, I think, going infinite. So in order to do that, you need to have multiple instances of the Barbarian class uh, effect. You can either copy that permanent or whatever, but you basically need to guarantee that you have a 50-50 chance of getting a six so you can keep going over and over you and over You need three. Again. Because yeah. if you have a barbarian class, you basically have a two out of or a one out of three chance to get a six. If you have another one, you've got a one out, a one out of two chance. So However, I we must consider that both three, no, three, four, and five actually take away loyalty counters. Ah. So three isn't enough. You actually have to have enough to guarantee that you're going to only get a six. Pretty much. Or have such a high chance of getting six that you're not in risk of making Comet kill himself from having all of those minus twos or minus ones happen. Right. And all of these cards, Barbarian Class, Will, Blade of Frontiers, Pixie Guide, they don't allow you to choose yeah. either. Like they they say when you would roll one dice, basically roll two instead. And but ignore. they don't say choose the one you want. They say ignore the lowest. Yeah. So you're always going to take the highest result. Which is actually bad in this case because if it's a three or four or five, then it's going to minus the right. Comet. So Comet might... Man, that's sad. Might die. Yeah, so you, uh, so you have to have, I think, it. something like five or six copies of Barbarian Class to technically say to the table with enough reasonable doubt, or not, well, I guess, no doubt, that you're going to be able to go infinite. There would still be some doubt. I mean, they could make you do it because it's not 100% that yeah, you would. Yeah, yeah. I think you can also just sort of tr 
get lucky because if you hit a six like on two rolls in a row yeah now all of a sudden you're up to like well i have four additional rolls and on all those rolls barbarian class is going to apply yeah then all of a sudden now i'm at a point where like i'm very likely to start rattling off sixes yeah um uh, boy, but then just keeping track of how many <laughs> But times. if you roll not enough sixes and then too many fours and fives, then you're going to minus, 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 and the comet's going to die. Yeah. So you have to do it in a specific order. It's a lot. Sounds confusing. It this is, is the kind confusing. of thing that please nobody do on game nights or extra turns. Because we're going to sit there and be like, oh, God. Oh, uh, boy. How do we keep oh, track of this? Boy. How do we Here figure they out? go yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Comet, I think, is actually just really fun if you're not trying to go too crazy with that. I think you still play this in the dice rolling deck, but you're not trying to make it go infinite. Building an entire deck to just get Comet to go infinite isn't even a win. Right. Uh, necessarily. Because you don't actually, I think, like, well, I think you are. No, it is. It, it, you it choose is one and two. You yeah. know, a half a million times, and then you do the damage part, right? Yeah, but I'm just saying, don't do it, please. <laughs> Play this in the dice rolling decks, decks, and don't actually try to go for the infinite thing. It's a lot of math, and I think the internet is still pretty divided about exactly how many of the barbarian class effects you need to say yes, I can do this. Whew. Yeah, because there's always a chance that you could just get extremely unlucky for a number of rolls in a row. Yeah, it's you know they'll make you have to prove it. I mean, if they really want to. I think if it's somebody's, you know, high enough, most players are just like, whatever. Okay, you got it. Yeah. Uh, Brazen Dwarf is also the infinite win because you're just rolling over and over and over again. Yeah. But you don't need it. If you go infinite on rolls, yeah. Comet's going to do the damage himself because he has that damage ability. Yeah, but let's say you only have like two Barbarian classes out. Then maybe a Brazen Dwarf is like a, okay, let's actually see if I can get it. I guess. If you roll 40 times, though, it feels like you would have won the other way anyway. Yeah. Anyway, lots to consider with Comet Stellar Pup. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm not sure that I like that card existing because it feels like whatever happens, it's going to take a long time. It, it may, That's a or, lot of dice rolling. Yeah, exactly. But if they never roll a six, it's a one in six chance. So yeah. we'll see. What's the card that, that um, at the beginning of combat you roll and then if you get a certain number, you create a copy? Oh. Uh, Delira? Yeah, I think Delina Wild Delina, Mage. Delina Wild Mage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That card already, like, sometimes people just rattle off, and we saw it on some of our gameplay yeah. videos, where they just get four or five copies of something by just getting lucky. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know... That's a D20 in that case, but yeah, you can definitely just pop off. Yeah, so... And that already kind of takes a while, and you gotta keep track, and, you know, I'm not saying that card is annoying, I think it's about right, but this one feels like it could be on the other side of that. Yeah, it's a good boy. Okay, next up, we have a fun one. Yeah, it is Exchange of Words. It's this podcast. <laughs> it is. This is us, Jimmy? Yeah. I'm, I'm, one of us is Angrath and one of us is a Johnny, and then we're switching, switching heads to become Ang Johnny. Um, all right. It's one blue blue for an enchantment. When Exchange of Words enters the battlefield, choose two target creatures. For as long as Exchange of Words remains on the battlefield, exchange the text boxes of those creatures okay let's talk about the rules here so exchange of words does not literally physically change the text on a card exchange of words creates a kind of like a layer effect on top it carries the effect with it so when this enchantment's on the battlefield it just puts the, it switches the text box but it, it's like almost like another layer a gl like a piece of paper on top of the text boxes if exchange of words leaves the battlefield those cards are back to normal so let's say jimmy has a mole drifter from before and i have i don't know a tim Yep. Well, all of a sudden, he would have a 2-2. Two -two that could tap. That taps to deal one damage to something, but it would still be an elemental, right? Because mm -hmm. that's not part of the rule text. And it would still be called a Mold Drifter, and it yeah. still costs four in the blue. Yeah. W but now I would have a Tim that's a 1-1 one -one wizard. Flying. Prodigal Sorcerer. But it would have flying, and it would have evoke for two in a blue, and also, say, when it enters the battlefield, draw two cards. Yeah. So, but if that card gets bounced, then it loses that text. So... This right. is exchange kind of, of words lose track of it if it gets flickered, bounced, yeah, or exactly. exchange of words goes away. So cards like Homeward Path, where it's like return all creatures that in the, that you own to you, you that doesn't matter because we're just switching text boxes here. Right. Uh, if your creature is like a Lurgoyf and it's got star star as its text, oh. if I switch it with any of my creatures, it dies? it dies because it no longer has this creature's power is equal to blah 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 blah. Never right. Parts, whatever. Yeah. It just becomes an instant zero zero. That's a that's an interesting way to kill one of those. Um, I think this is a way to also give a creature that you don't want to someone else without actually physically giving them the card because you can choose your abyssal persecutor and someone else's one one yeah so you can give them that card uh and then if you and then if like the player that controls one of the creatures dies the text box are still switched interesting <sighs> 
So much. <laughs> so much dumb stuff. Okay, you can also steal, like, impactful creature abilities. So if you have an Ulamog, and I have a 1-1 Josh Lee Kwai soldier token, oh. I can make that into Ulamog's text box, but it's still a 1-1. Josh Lee Kwai soldier token with Annihilator. Yeah, War. I that's like what that. I'm talking about. Okay. Um, Fauna Shaman, Royal Assassin, these types of cards are more interesting to think, oh, I want that effect, and I've got a dumb token or something that I don't want the cards, or the card's already done its thing. Well, also, if you stole someone's Fauna Shaman, it doesn't have haste. No. Right? But if you switch the text box, the rules text, my creature's the same creature and would not have summoning sickness if it already was there since my untap. Because that, you, And yeah, I could right. use the Fauna Shaman right away. So in some ways, it could be better than stealing it. Yeah, exactly. That's actually a really good point. If you're just saying, hey, give me that control magic, your tap ability. Well, you can't use it this turn because you haven't controlled it before since before your upkeep or whatever. Yeah, since you're on tap. Yeah. But your creature itself has been there if, if you've already had it. And then switching to Xbox, well, it can do it. Yeah. Pretty cool. I didn't even think about that. So, yeah, it's... It's definitely going to have some interesting uses. And, of course, you can switch your opponent's two creatures. None of the creatures has to be yours. Yeah. And this could maybe be useful if they have certain synergies. Let's say they have, like, a zombie lord, Mm -hmm. and they have an elf lord, and you go switch them, and now, like, you don't have no zombies, so the zombie (laughs) lord doesn't matter for you, and you you ain't got no elves, Elves, so the elves don't matter for you. You know, stuff like that, you can probably find tricky situations. It's definitely going to be the type of card you have it in your hand, and you go, oh, here's a weird thing I can do. Yeah, it definitely seems like, hey, look, I can't get rid of it, but I can do something else that if i kind of do this then and everyone goes what are you talking about and then you play exchange of words yeah so it's a very interesting very interesting card i'm sure in the future there will be more things that people think of and come up with and we encourage you to post them in the comments as well but it seems kind of cool i, I actually kind of like it mm-hmm. all right moving Did on you choose two of your own creatures yes two target creatures it could be your own creatures as well I wonder if there's a way to break that. It feels like... You could add indestructible to a creature that normally, normally doesn't have it. But it wouldn't have its other abilities. Yeah, it so. wouldn't have its other abilities. So, But here's the thing. Cards that say if you control your commander doesn't uh-huh. care. So you could make your commander into an indestructible something maybe by switching the text. But if you don't care about the text... Uh, and so your commander is always there. You can cast your, you know, whatever it is. I'd be interested to hear, because you get to control what's in your deck. So you can put cards that maybe you'd want to target your own two creatures and there's some sort of synergy or combo there with exchange of words. The other way, if I'm exchanging with other people's decks, I don't know what decks they're going to be playing. I don't yeah. necessarily always know it's in there, so it's hard to plan for that. Yeah, uh, there's probably something, too, in terms of like, hey, this creature has really high power and toughness, and this ca- this card other card cares about power and toughness but makes you have to have it hmm. like add you know power to it so you could switch the text and be cool now it's a 10 10 and i didn't have to add equipment to get it to you know whatever the like spike shot feeder type of cards yeah yeah right what would happen if you did this to let's say one of the creatures created by what was that first legendary creature uh, magar yeah well, that is a, so the text on the card is still going to be there, and it says whenever you cast a instant or sorcery, sorry, no, let's just read it again. So, oh my gosh, now we're going deep, Josh. So, we should really have a judge when we start discussions like this, because we're definitely going to get some things wrong, but it's fun to think about. Magar's creatures that he makes when he pays one black and a red, uh, so you note the name of an instant or sorcery, and then it puts it on the battlefield face down, and it has the text, whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you may create a copy of the card with the noted name. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. So is that why you have to note a name? Because if you switch the text box... Right. It doesn't care what the card itself is. It's what it's did what's you the note noted name. name. So you yeah. would switch the noted name onto another card, right? That maybe is bigger. Let's say it's a seven-seven or indestructible. Well, it can't. It would lose it and give that to the card. Oh, that, no, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's it, right. Because it yeah, loses yeah, yeah. Billy. But let's say it's just big. It's got. It's like a seven-seven, more likely to get through. But it says, "Oh, now I've hit with my seven says, and my text now says noted name. Cast that thing." Right. So you look at that card and go, "Which one did you note for that one?" And I switched. That. Okay, cool, cool. Oh, I'm going to cast that card. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Maybe there's some weird stuff you could do. There's something yeah. there, yeah. I, I, if anything, it kind of diverts attention because it's like, oh, you need to get rid of that thing. And then maybe you have a way of removing exchange of words to return it back to its normal self. Once right. the people take, yeah, I don't know. It's It seems a little ridiculous. Uh, Spike Shot Elder. So one red red, it deals damage equal to its power to target creature or player, but it's a 1-1. One, one. Mm. So you could put that onto a 10-10 and pay one mm. red red, hit someone for 10. That's pretty sweet. There you go. Okay. We did it. We broke we it. We broke it. Yeah. Broken. It's broken. broken in half. Absolutely broken. Yep. Sawed in half. Yeah. Ban it immediately. It's basically like, what was that black card? Uh, saw in half. Yeah. Yeah. yeah saw in half. Yeah. The yeah, card you just go. said the name of. No, no, I didn't. That's it. <laughs> you were All imagining right. that. The next card is Boing. Boing. It's one in a blue for an instant. Return target creature to its owner's hand, then roll a six sided die. If the result is three or less, 
scry a number of cards equal to the result. Okay. So bounce something and possibly scry three. Yeah. You, if it's a four, or five, or, or six, one. you still bounce the thing. You just don't scry at all. Yeah. They, they just decided scry four is insane. We can't <laughs> let them do that. And you're rolling four. If it's got four chances out of six to roll that as well. And this has reverse synergy with barbarian class and things like that. Because obviously you have to. Oh, you want the lower numbers here. Yeah. yeah. So, and that seems like they did that on purpose because it would be too powerful. But hey, one in or one half of the time without barbarian class and stuff out, you will scry something when you bounce a thing. Yeah, one, two, or three. And, and three is like draw a card. Yeah. Yeah. Three can be really good. Um, you wrote scry tribal down which i think yeah. is, makes a lot of sense elegath crossroads agar uh siani eye of the storm all care about scrying and you'll draw cards instead um pretty good Count something draw two or three is insane for two mana and it's, yeah it's yeah good. i also could see this being pretty good in like my paco and Halden deck because i'm oh, trying yeah. to scry my own top of my deck every time uh, just paco to know what's attacks. there yeah just know it's there and, and to put an instant or sorcery that you want to cast later on or whatever mm -hmm. um so it seems like just kind of a cool common bounce spell I could definitely see this being just like a very nice value add for cheaper popper decks as well. Mm. You get a ton of value off of this. You're bouncing something. Trying. And sometimes, man, there have been so many game nights I've lost just because if I could have bounced a single creature, I would have survived. So Someday we'll maybe do an episode about removal, but I believe that bounce is very underrated. I was just having an argument with some people here because I, I think capsize is underrated. Yeah. And it's a card I play a lot of because capsize bounce is generally roughly equivalent to destroy or even exile it's like a time walk almost yeah in general bouncing it is stopping it at the moment where it's going to do the scariest thing it can yeah. do and that's really what removal does in commander you're not generally like get rid of that forever and you'll never get it back and that's what i want to do most of the time you're like get rid of that right now because of the thing it's doing right now and bounce does that mm -hmm. and is usually more flexible as well and also Things like indestructible don't work against bounce. There's yeah. less defense against it. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And we value mana so much now. If you are down just a little bit of mana, then it's so hard to come back in yeah. some instances. Yeah. As the games are sort of shorter than they used to be, you just don't have as much leniency towards you know, yeah, mana man, efficiency. Yeah. this seven drop. Like imagine if you played your freaking you know a seven drop and someone bounces it before you as you go to equip and you paid something to equip. It's like oh gosh. Yep. <laughs> so sorry. You're just never coming back. I wasted nine mana. You only. Yeah. Two. That card is not coming back. Yeah. It's, I cast a. Uh, suspend a, a card that removed Vinny's commander in the extra turns and gives it suspend three and it's like that thing's gone forever yeah, it's, it's it, never coming it's back it's not coming yeah, back yeah. the game's not going to be still going in three turns uh okay um and if not it's just a good tempo play just to slow someone down give you some more time scry some as an upside potentially so i could just see this just having good a little bit of play yeah yeah, yeah. all right the next card oh that's you vidalkin squirrel whacker guess what it has to do with die rolling three in the blue for a star star vidalkin guest if you switch this, because it's a star star, then you're going to just straight it's murder gonna it. It's going to die yeah. with the, yeah. <laughs> As it enters the battlefield, you roll a six-sided die twice, and its base power becomes the first result, and its base toughness becomes the second result. So pay, pay four for this, roll a dice, I get a three and a two, this becomes a three-two. And then if you would roll one or more six-sided dice, instead roll them and you may exchange one result with Vidalcan Squirrel Whacker's base power or base toughness. So now let's say you're playing this mm. and with Comet and you roll a dice and you roll a four and you're like, I don't actually want that. I want a six. Well, I rolled a six and my Vidalcan Squirrel work Whacker earlier. So it's a four, six. So I'm going to swap that six out. And so you kind of kind of... So now it's a four, four. To store a result, basically. Yeah, store a couple of results. Yeah. Yeah. And this is actually really good because now for the cards like boing which want a low result a three or yeah you're like oh i didn't want that high number or comet mm -hmm. um wants sixes specifically yeah and doesn't want fours and fives and stuff you just can maybe switch them out for things you want so th i can even see low numbers being something you want on this thing yeah and for certain uh scenarios yeah that's pretty cool it's a it's a it's a twist on barbarian class but it's in the same uh you know league with those cards i think yeah i think there's a similar card in the contraptions world where you could store a result and then yeah. you could pull it out later so it's kind of cool it, again the dice rolling deck will have more upside in the future so this I, could be a card that has more value too it feels like one of the problems of the dice rolling deck is it's straddling too many colors where yeah. like how do you get green for the green one in there you know vrondis is green red it can't have the blue card right. so yeah it's, it's red white yeah it's looking for sort of Somebody Five to, color dice roll. Somebody to come in and be like, yeah, because any two colors doesn't feel like it has enough dice rolling. Um, you really want, you I feel know. like you have to have red. Yeah, you got to have red and blue, probably. Yeah, but blue, there's some yeah. good stuff in green because of Rondis. Yep. And there's now a little bit of white stuff because of Comet. And so, like, what is unifying all those colors together so that I can create a dice rolling deck that reaches a critical mass of dice rolling stuff mm -hmm. the best dice rolling cards so yeah that's that feels like the problem right now it's a lot to do okay all right we got one more card left 
This one is legitimately just good, and it's not that weird. It's a little weird, but... Yeah, it's like, it's it still takes a little bit of accounting, but it's not that crazy. I mean, it's not harder than Cathar's Crusade is often. <laughs> True. All right, it's called Starlight Spectacular. It's too white white for an enchantment. It has parade! Woo! With an exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning <laughs> of combat on your turn, choose creatures you control one at a time until each creature you control has been chosen. Nice. So you have five creatures, you go, you know, one, two, three, four, five in order. Mm -hmm. And then it says, each of those creatures gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for each creature chosen before it. Ah, so it is like a parade where go, as you go down the line, they each get a little bit stronger than the last one. Yeah, so the last creature you choose will get the biggest amount of pump. Okay. So let's say you have three creatures you have three one ones very yeah. easy three one one elves so you choose one then the other then the other the first one you choose will get zero because it was the first creature chosen the second one will get plus one so it'll become a two two and the third one will get plus two because two creatures were chosen before it and become a three three and you've added three total power oh that's not with that your impressive. three creatures yeah but but it, it starts to get crazy once you're you know you've got a lot of creatures. Mm -hmm. So once you've got, let's say, five creatures, you're adding 10 total power. Plus now. one, plus two, plus three, plus four. Yep. Wow. So, you know, once you're up at 10 creatures, it's an insane amount. Yeah. Of but five creatures seems pretty doable for a token deck. And this is the... It, by the way, this is four mana, and I feel like this does a pretty comparable job to Cathar's Crusade. Yeah. Comes out a little earlier, still has a huge impact. Yeah, and the night... Yeah, like you said, um, it's right before combat. So the turn you play it... You get the pump, which Cathar's Crusade does not do, right? Yeah, you got to build your Cathar's, board. Cathar's, you have to play it and then play more creatures. And we'll probably get there as far as like eventually equalizing with what Starlight Spectacular will do. Yeah. But, you know, it's going to take a turn, extra turn or two, which, like we were saying, you don't often have that amount of time these days. Mm -hmm. um, so I really do like this as a, if your board's big, you can just play this. And it's kind of like Craterhoof in some instances where it's like, play it, uh, go to attacks, you know, add. 12, 15, 20 power to my board right now. Yeah. And they're get, swinging. Yeah, you don't get trampled or all that, but it doesn't really matter. You're just going to have a lot of power. And in those token go wide decks, that's all you want to do is just find different ways to do that. Cathar's Crusade usually is remove on site. So I like that this is play it, go to combat. You'll still get the trigger if someone doesn't have instant speed removal. Yeah. And if they remove it on the next turn, you probably already got some amount of damage through because of value out of it. Yeah. And then of course, it becomes really good. Um, similar to Morag, which is an extra combat spell, and extra combats with this are going to be nuts because you keep the pump from before, yeah, and, and then you get again. the pump again. So even if you have f five creatures, you add 10 power, then go to combat. They still have the added 10 power from before, right. if you, and you cast uh, or you use Aggravated Assault or something, and on the second combat, you get another 10 power. So that second combat is plus 20 power from what your normal would be. Yeah, Starlight says at the beginning of combat on your turn. So it's not the first combat. It's any time you get to combat. Yeah, so Morag, Port Razor, um, you know, these extra combat cards. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good. I like how the rules text at the bomb said, places everyone, the first creature in line gets plus zero, plus zero. <laughs> <laughs> They're just doing it for the exposure. Places everyone. <laughs> yeah, I do love that. Yeah, so I could definitely see this card actually getting some play. Yeah. I think it has, the of all of them, Magar is my second favorite, and then Split and Saw in Half is just obvious combo potential, so... Yeah, I think Saw in Half, we're going to see the most just because it is very powerful and you can play it fairly. Um, I wouldn't, you know... If, I mean, if you have any creatures in your deck that, it, especially if you're trying to double up on the end of the battlefields, then great. Otherwise, you could also just make two blockers. Yep. You know, there's a lot of upside. But Starlight Spectacular might be the second, the one I predict to see the, the second most just because it fills a role we know it's yeah. needed. It's kind of at a, hopefully going to be at a low price point and it's going to do what you want in those token go wide decks where, hey, if you got six, five, six plus creatures, it's going to pump them by a lot. Yeah, and any extra combats, oh my gosh, it really gets good at that point. Yeah. All right, those were our favorite cards from Infinity. To the listeners, what's your favorite card from Infinity? What do you think is the most powerful card from the set besides Saw in Half? Because we already know that. Yeah, that's the correct yeah. Answer. Are there any cards you wish were legal that have an acorn? Um, anything you're going to try and rule zero for your playgroup? Uh, are you on board with the stickers and attractions, or do you think that's just too complicated and just too much? Yeah. Are I, you on board with stickers and attractions, Jimmy? Or you think well, it's here, I, I read in the rules that you are not allowed to put a sticker on anything you do not own. Right. It, the way stickers work, they only um, apply to, or are applied to your own cards. So I'm not like reaching over and grabbing a card and jamming a sticker on top of it, even if it is in a quadruple sleeve. Uh, so that won't happen. 
players and you're also allowed to use like sticks of paper pieces of paper or whatever on top to indicate what a sticker is as well so i think as long as you're prepared and it doesn't like cost many many minutes throughout the game to do so i'm happy to play against them i don't want to carry around more than i already have and i have a lot them carrying around between the tokens and the extra sleeves in case... You don't want an like, attraction deck and now a oh sticker deck? And I, like I can't build a sideboard. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to build an attraction sideboard unless it's so sweet and so cool. But no thanks. Yeah, I think stickers just cross the line from me into like too much complication and time added to like outside you know manipulating of dice are enough yeah it makes you have to do a lot more as a player and yeah. if you're down for that then great go for it because again you're not allowed to put stickers on my stuff so i'm not worried about that side of it it's more just hey are you gonna take a 20 minute turn because you're slowly applying stickers to everything or you and, and they already got to work did around this with yeah. the uh, keyword counters mm -hmm. you know that came out in what was that in uh, uh the mutate set right yeah, yeah. so Ikoria. yeah yeah and to me, it's like, well, we already solved this, and that's the same as stickers. Like, it's not that much different. Yeah. And so, why do we need? I don't know. With the t and and also, by the way, stickers require ticket counters and basically keeping track of energy. So, just the amount of accounting and th accounting and things I've got to keep track of, or you have to keep track of, and I have to double check that you're keeping track of correctly. Right. Yeah. To me, like, it's not my favorite. Ooh. If you want to play your sticker deck against me, yes, I, I'm not going to be like no. But <laughs> in internally, I'm gonna, I might groan a little bit. You know, speaking of Ikoria, I realized if you mutate a creature a bunch of times, it creates a singular text box at the oh. top. So maybe you could swap that out for something. Exchange of words, that thing. Bounce the whole pile. Wow. Mut mutate again. I don't know. Maybe exchange of words is the card we're going to see the most because it does seem like you can do the craziest stuff with it. Yeah, the fact that you can target your own stuff too yeah. adds that extra layer. Uh, we'll see. Let us know if it's fun. All right, if you want to get your hands on any Unfinity cards or any of the 40K precons or any Dominator United, or maybe you want to pre-order Brothers War... There's so much product these days. Cardkingdom.com slash command is the best place to go to order your magic products, singles, anything at all. Card Kingdom really does have, we say it over and over, but it's true, the best and fastest shipping in the entire business. Love them. They will get you your cards faster than anybody else. If you're like us and you suddenly get excited about a card like Exchange of Words, which I'm like, I might need a couple copies of that. I'm probably we're gonna hit or we're gonna hit stop on the camera on this episode, and I'm gonna go order a couple from Card Kingdom, and I'm gonna have them in my, yeah, sorry, slash command There you go. And I'm gonna have <laughs> them in my hands before I know it, and I'm really excited about that because I'm just gonna slide them into a couple decks. So yeah, yeah. test it out. Yeah, cardkingdom.com slash command. That's the best place to go to get your products, and it really does support all of our content. Yep, and you can also support our content by going to ultrapro.com slash command. Pick up the other things you need for your game board: your sweet Unfinity play mats, the secret layer arts that only. Ultra Pro gets access to, including the official art from the sets. Anytime they have those cool art deco things from like Capenna or whatever, Ultra Pro has that stuff. So if you see art that you really like and you want to get a playmat or sleeves of it, there's a good chance Ultra Pro is carrying something that is going to whet your appetite. So if you go to ultrapro.com slash command, you can browse their entire store there or just pick up some stuff from your LGS, support your local stores as well, and you're also supporting the show. All right, now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of mag magic. Jimmy, hmm. I do have something cool. You do? I do I do too, but I like when you already pr are prepared because I haven't really been thinking. Well, this <laughs> one, and I believe this is going to time up correctly because as serendipity would have it, we were asked to do a promotion for uh, oh, a show, right. on an Amazon show that I happen to like. Have you watched Rings of Power? I have. I have not, however, watched the most recent episode because I'm waiting for seven and eight to both be out to just <laughs> in one fell swoop. Yeah. So you saw the volcano one though? Oh yeah. Okay, let's not spoil that, but <laughs> oh, yeah. it was so sweet. Yeah, um, that, that of all the episodes, that one I was like, I'm back in Middle Earth, baby. Oh, Here we go. so good. Yeah. Yeah. So probably during this episode, uh, you might have heard an ad that we were asked to do <laughs> Uh, for, for an auxiliary show for the Rings of Power. For Rings of Power. And, you know, when they came to us um, and said, would you be willing to endorse the show? We were like, yes! Totally! <laughs> because we love the show. So it, I was already planning to have it be an, on, uh, or an end step. Me and, too. you know, this is just the perfect time to do it because... Um, you know, I, I think I was trepidatious, like, going in, having seen the marketing materials originally for Lord of the Rings. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a huge, huge token fan, but I've read all the books. I've read The Cimmerillion a number wow, of years. Wow, you reread The Cimmerillion? I didn't reread it. I've just read it. It's okay, been, like, okay. 20 years. <laughs> but, yeah, in, out, uh, in uh, my early college years, I, you know, read all those books, and I read The Hobbit and stuff in high school. And so I ha generally know about the story. Yeah. And... You know, obviously, Lord of the Rings trilogy, one of the great trilogies of all time. The Hobbit trilogy, not one of the greatest trilogies of all time. So, movies wise, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I mean. Sorry, the movies. Okay. Um, 
And so going in, I don't know how you felt about it, but seeing the early trailers and stuff, I was I was worried. I had no idea what to expect, also because we know for a fact that they spent approximately one billion dollars on this show which means about a hundred million per episode basically <laughs> it's insane it's a movie every single episode but it that really does is. not always mean quality there's been plenty of things like the hobbit yeah where a lot of money was spent and the end product was mediocre you know so that's being very kind to those movies yeah so yeah i was seeing the trailers and things and i was worried it looked a little too shiny to me right a little too glossy it looked like a in the in short form and like TV promos, it looked kind of like a, I don't know, like a WB show or something. Yeah, and how are you going to tell the story, right? What's the pacing going to be like? What's the writing, the actors? There's so many things that could go awry for yeah. something like this. And I watched, you know, the first episode and I was like, nope, it's good. It's It looks beautiful. The acting's, you know, good. It's not perfect by any means, but yeah. it... Like, I'm in it. I, I'm excited for the next episode. Yeah, the production quality is nuts. Uh, yep. They filmed it all in New Zealand, so I'm really familiar with all the locations. And you the, you can tell each piece of armor, the Numenor, the way they built those docks out. Yep. You know when you're watching Game of Thrones sometimes, and you're like, oh, okay, there's like one real boat here. And it's <laughs> not even the full boat. It's like the front of it. And you can tell, yeah, everything feels and looks real in Lord of the Rings. And it's really only the stuff in the distance that feels like they're really p painting the CGI, matte painting stuff on. So to that end, I was like, nice. Yeah, I mean, it really, what a what a time to be alive in that this thing just came out that they spent a billion dollars of and we just got it for free. I know you have to have Prime, but yeah, yeah. that was a thing I was already going to have. It's not like... Right, you didn't subscribe to it. Not like me back when Game of Thrones was coming out. I was paying like an extra 30 bucks a just month for Just to have HBO. it go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. this is like, I'm using... I'm subscribing to this for a totally different reason. And then I just get, you know... This like, thing on top. Like four movies yeah. <laughs> for free. You know, top tier blockbuster, like yeah. spend $250 million movies. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Rings of Power on Amazon. I've really been enjoying it. Uh, I don't have the same willpower you have, so I did watch uh, seven, and I'm excited for eight. Eight will have come out by the time you watch it, so it's nice, all out. Nice, 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 nice. Um, oh, yeah, it was good. I, not yeah. as good as six. Six is in a... Is, well, they're following, like, another part of the story, I think, yeah. from the trailer. And they're starting to set up what the finale is, so it's a little bit more set up than six, which felt like it had a lot of uh, yeah. culmination of, like, other events they, coming They spent a long time casting for this show, too, and they went all over the world to find people, and I think they actually did a really good job casting each part. Every time an actor speaks up, and you're like, nice, yeah. Yeah, I, f I feel like you're that thing that that's that character or whatever it is. Yeah, all the line delivery feels like I buy it. It feels yeah. real, and nobody's like a really big name either, so that yeah. doesn't like could which could distract. But also, it's hard to do if you're not going to cast like you know actors that right. are already established. Like sometimes it's hit and miss. But no, they did a really great job. So yeah, and all, my wife and I've been walking around the house just going Sauron at Sauron. each other. Sauron, Sauron. Sauron. God, real. Sauron. They roll their R's so good. Yeah, it's great. Uh, okay, check we it out. We didn't get paid for this end step. We no. got paid for the middle ad, but we were just <laughs> excited because we're like, yes, yeah. we like this thing. And there's a lot of discussion about it too. You'll find tons of people have a lot of great takes on it and pe people that really know the Tolkien stuff too. And like, yeah, so you you'll check it out. All right, clamp set. Big thanks oh, for our... Wait, oh, we wait. should say too though. Oh? Next year, there's going to be a Lord of the Rings magic set. Oh, that's right. It's not tied to this show. Yeah, it's not tied to this it's show at all. It's based on the books and everything, but still, like, I mean, it does have a tie into magic, which is Tol kind of exciting. Tolkien is considered the like the originator of fantasy. most fantasy. Yeah, and we're yeah. talking like, what, not the 30s or something? Or is it before that? I forget when it was, but when he it was, started... It was the 20s or the 30s, yeah, because he was... A lot of it's based on his experiences in World War One, because yeah. he was like in the trenches. So like... Mordor is kind of like the no man's land of like the trench warfare in yeah. World War One. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's the granddaddy of high fantasy though, for sure. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, clean up set. Big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Damon Lenz, Arthur Meadowcroft, Ashlyn Rose, Lady Danger, Manson, Lung, Craig Blanchett, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Wall, Grav Glide, Truck Tie, Jamie Block, Mitch Trevor, and Evan Limberger. Big thanks as well to Jeffrey Palmer. He does the Living Card animations that live behind us here on set. They also start the show on our YouTube channel. You can find them on Twitter at Living Cards MTG. All right, everybody. That's going to do it for Unfinity. We'll be talking about Brothers War very, very soon. Hooray. Yeah. Moving right along. <laughs> Brothers War, we've already gotten to take a look at it. And uh, spoiler alert, there's some really cool stuff, though. There is some really, really cool yeah. stuff. All right. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator.
Greetings, humans. <laughs>